This summer, my dad lost his wallet while taking a shortcut through the woods. Let me give you the scenario here. He and mom ran out of gas on the interstate. And as they pulled to the side, he saw the next exit up about a quarter or a half mile. And there looming over the trees was the Shell gas station sign. The quickest way from point A to point B, being a straight line, well, he decided, I'm going to go through the woods. He ended up encountering some pretty thorny vines on the way. And when he finally arrived at the gas station, his back pocket had been ripped out of his shorts, along with his wallet and the $500 cash that it contained for vacation. It's not crazy to search for something that valuable for two hours in the Georgia heat. What would have been crazy is if dad had found the wallet and then continued to search for it. When we find something that we've lost, we're happy, and then we stop looking for it. In the Gospel reading this morning, Jesus explains to some Pharisees through a couple of parables that his purpose was not to find the found. Rather, he is one who seeks the lost. These Pharisees, as they so often do again and again in the Gospels, betray a fairly arrogant opinion of themselves. And as often accompanies uh, a self-inflated ego, they also clung to a very low opinion of most other people around them. You can practically hear their muttered spite ringing clearly through the millennia as they say, this man, avoiding Jesus' name like he's Voldemort, welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, wasn't that a true statement? Yeah, absolutely it was. We know that there were tax collectors among this group. They were the, the lying, cheating, swindling cronies of the Romans that duped people out of quite a bit of money. That derogatory term that they use, sinners, would have denoted those who were well known for outward public sins in the Jewish society. They were the outcasts. They were the undesirables, those that had the scarlet letter pinned onto their chests. So that whenever they went about, anybody with a shred of self-respect would avoid them like the plague. You didn't want to associate with them. Are you an outcast? I'd say that people are generally welcoming of me when I meet them. I have a lot of friends. No, I would not consider myself an outcast of society. But if you had a video camera recording of my entire life, the things that I do and the things that I say, especially with the, the subtitled captions of the thoughts that are going through my mind, if you could watch that, I would be the most outcast of outcasts. You would run me out of this church. People would hate me everywhere. And anywhere that I tried to live, I would be driven away from. The story goes that there was a missionary in Zambia who was greatly revered by the people in his town, and with good reason. He was well known for his goodness of conduct. He was sincere. He was upright. He was blameless in the eyes of the people. So one day, one of his parishioners said, Pastor, how is it that you are so good and so righteous all the time? And the missionary replied, Good? Yeah, you might see me as good. But if you knew the thoughts of my heart, the children themselves would pelt me with rocks to drive me out of this town. Glance around you. Look at the people sitting to your left and to your right. This is a room that is full of broken, despondent people. We are tax collectors and sinners alike, every one of us, from the guy standing right here in the front of church 
for the little kids in the back pew. And there is no way that God should want anything to do with us, ever. So how is it, then, that I can be such a belittling Pharisee all of the time? Let me give you a scenario. You walk into the sanctuary next week for church, and it's filled with transgendered prostitutes and burnt-out meth dealers. I can imagine that most of you, upon seeing this, would probably return to the parking lot and to your vehicles, because who wants to be around that? Or perhaps you're driving along uh, during the week, and you see uh, Pastor Kester having a picnic with a couple dozen half-crazed homeless people. What's he doing with... Can anybody really help them at this point? They're too far gone. And suddenly we start to sound a lot like the Pharisee from another of Jesus' parables. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. So which am I? Am I the Pharisee or am I these tax collectors and sinners? Yes, just as was the case for those Pharisees with whom Jesus was speaking. We know how busted up inside we truly are. We know the, the accusations of our sins against our consciences. We have wandered far and we have wandered wide like stupid sheep who think that they're going to find greener pastures on their own as though the shepherd were somehow holding out on them. And yet we esteem ourselves so highly in the fact like these Pharisees, that there seem to be a lot of other sheep that have wandered further and are a lot more far gone than I am. And all of these things just pile together on that record of our offenses against our God. Poor, miserable sheep who have wandered away from the paths of righteousness. So often in church and in Bible classes, in our conversations as Christians, we we tend to focus on how Jesus was like us, that he was human, that he ate, that he slept, all this. But in this instance, Jesus shows us just how unlike us he is. Whereas we have seen those lost in their brokenness, and only serve to break them down further through our condescension and derision, Jesus does exactly the opposite. He is here to find the lost. You know, when Jesus was speaking with those tax collectors and with those sinners, he wasn't just trying to affect some sort of outward change in their behavior. He wasn't looking for for a conformity to morality. If he were, his message to them would have been, be more like those Pharisees you see over there. No, he was here for a much, much deeper purpose than such a superficial whitewashing. He is here because he actually rescues the lost, and he does this by dying for them. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. At the cross, we are found in the most beautiful of ways. At the cross, this man, Jesus Christ, poured out his own blood and breathed out his own death rattle to pay the punishment for all of our wandering ways. And it is at the cross where God, this one who ate with tax collectors and sinners reconciles us with God from whom we had turned in all of our wandering ways. We read in our Old Testament lesson this morning, although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. 
at that cross is where the anger of God against you because of your sin is turned against his own dear son. At that cross, the comfort of your Father in heaven who loves you finds you, lost sheep, as he brings you his very own family. At that cross, we draw up that water from the wells of salvation and drink of it deeply. Jesus knew of that righteousness that he would win for all of mankind there, which is why when he was speaking with sinners and tax collectors, he was able to announce his forgiveness to them, to those who were as outcast from the presence of God as we are, or as we were. He states that as his own purpose a few chapters later in Luke 19. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So sing. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. God has turned his anger away. Instead, he now comforts us. And so we sing and we praise him and we let ring forth to the nations this, these, these gospel tidings, this good news, fearlessly and faithfully. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul wrote, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. This gospel message is that which silences that voice of the Pharisee inside of us which believes it must do good things in order to make God happy with us. This gospel message also silences that voice of the guilty inside of us which thinks that God could never love it because of all its bad fruits. This gospel message reveals that righteousness of God, a righteousness that becomes ours through faith in its message. When you, through faith, were brought out of darkness and into light, heaven rejoiced jubilantly. The, 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 the angels themselves sang joyfully over every man, woman, and child among us who, through word in the sacraments, has been brought out of death and into life. How then can I not show such great care and concern for all of those other lost souls out there? How will I not, along with the angels, sing joyfully over every individual that is brought into God's family, into your own family? And this is really what Jesus was, was emphasizing with those Pharisees. He, he, he showed them how they would go out and search for one of their sheep if it were lost and be joyful when they found it. If you, if your family had two dogs and one ran away, would you be content to simply sit back and enjoy the one that you still have? Or would you go out and look for your dog? Now, if the Pharisees should do this for sheep, and if we would do this for a dog, how much more will we not show care and concern over the everlasting souls of human beings. The author C.S. Lewis wrote about all of these people around us. He says, they're not ordinary people, but it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Care about those immortal souls of people. Jesus certainly does care about the wicked, vilest offenders who are rushing headlong right now on that path to perdition. We like to associate with and minister to people very often who are, who are similar to us. Those who have the, the same standard of morality that we would hold to, those who are of the same socioeconomic sphere, but hear this. 
Our calling as Christians is not to evangelize other Christians. Jesus does not tell us to make disciples of disciples, to find the found. Rather, our calling as as Christians and as a church is to reach out to those who have no semblance of a relationship with Christ in their lives, whether they are drunks, druggies, mafia thugs, or the wealthy guy who lives next door, has a great family life, and wants nothing to do with Christ. As Christ has shown such great concern for all of our lost souls, how much more will we not now be motivated to show that care and concern for others ourselves? Notice also that there is a search that takes place in these parables. We're kidding ourselves if we think that the lost are just going to show up at our doorstep wondering what we have to offer and so we can just like sit there and wait. It does happen, yeah, but it's rare. See that example that's set in the parables. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Doesn't the woman light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds the coin? As individuals and as a church, this requires effort on our parts as we now carry on our Savior's work to reach those lost sheep, to find those lost coins. How exactly this will look will vary from individual to individual and from congregation to congregation. As Gethsemane Lutheran Church, as the members, you are going to have to wrestle with some of these questions. When you're writing your plan of ministry, when you are just having conversations with each other during fellowship time in between service or after service, often often we, we tend to be inwardly focused. The temptation is to focus or, or, or to see the 99 around us and just be content with that. But now knowing just how much care and concern our Savior has showed for us, we adopt that similar attitude again. Take joy in finding those people and plan as, as a congregation the methods, plan the steps that you are going to take in order to reach out for them. You know, that that story that I told at the beginning with my dad's wallet, it kind of has an interesting ending. He didn't find it. After two hours of searching, they gave up. They drove off. They had vacation to get to. About a month later, Some friends of the family who had heard the woeful tale stopped at the same exit, decided that they were going to conduct their own little search, maybe just for a few minutes, get out of the car and stretch, and they found it. They found the wallet. You know, my dad, he's got thousands of of dollars squirreled away in the bank for retirement, but that $500 in the wallet caused him to call his friends and to call his kids uh, with, the, with the happy news and the good story. We who were lost in a far worse way than that wallet have been found. Heaven has rejoiced jubilantly over each and every one of you individuals. Now, Let's make those angels sing again and again as we reach out to those lost people by proclaiming the salvation of our God to the nations and to Omaha. Amen. Please stand. 